Okay, let's do what I mean. Let's do what I mean. So, all right, so we've talked uh, the past few weeks, we, we kind of did a little study about the places where Paul mentions sin uh, in, in his epistles and how he gives these lists of sin. And, and, you know, we often think that Paul is the apostle of grace, and he is. He's the dispenser of the dispensation of grace, and he is. But he also talks about sin in his epistles, and, and we talked about the different contexts in which he does that. Um, there's really five places. Uh, we, we looked at four of them kind of in detail, but there's five places. Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and Galatians chapter 5, and 2 Timothy chapter 3. I didn't say them in the right order, but those are the five places. And so Romans 1 and 2 Timothy 3 are sort of the bookends to that. And uh, I'll just read through them, and then I, I want to say some things more about the others. Uh, Romans chapter 1 and, let's see, verse number um, uh, verse number 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, un implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do them. And so we saw this, you know, Paul sets forth here the reasons why, um, how, how mankind went away from God and how God gave up, as it were, on man. In the, in the four, three verses above, verse 24, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, dishonoring the bodies between themselves. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women to change the natural use so he gave them up he gave them up he gave them over to reprobate mind and paul lists the the condition if you will of mankind of the people that became the gentiles uh when god gave them up and you see that listing of sins that he has there um you know, we're not going to go through all the, the, the sins in detail, but you can see the listing, um, and you know, there's nothing in there that's very appealing, very palatable. It just is the condition of mankind as he turns away from God. When mankind turns away from God, this is what he turns to, this listing of sins. And then, so if you go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy is sort of the other end of the spectrum, in 2 Timothy, Paul is going to give us a list of sins. And, and these five places where Paul lists these sins, it is a, uh, they're not identical in every case, but you know, identical listing of sins, but they all center around the same kinds of things. Uh, when, you, when you're separated from God, when you're alienated from God, when you turn away from God, you turn toward these other things. And, and that list in Romans 1, as we pointed out a couple weeks ago, that list in Romans 1 is prior to the law. You know, this is not the Levitical system. This is not the Ten Commandments. This is not when God, God categorizes all the, the law for Israel. This is prior to all of that. So prior to all of that, even when there was no law that God had given, this is the condition of man. Mankind is identified as being sinful and, and, and uh, doing all of these sinful, unrighteous deeds even before the law is given. The law is given to identify that sin and to spotlight that sin and, and, and point out that sin even more so, but it existed even before the law was here. In 2 Timothy, Paul is going to give us a, a list of sins uh, in verse, uh, verse 1 of 2 Timothy 3. This know also then the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And so Paul in this passage gives us a list of sins 
and specifically in the last days perilous times shall come and as we pointed out when we went through this list men shall be these things now my my belief my understanding is that what Paul's saying there is this is true of the church the body of Christ um, because it, it seems like given what he says in Romans 1 about the condition of man in time past way back at the beginning when he turned away from God uh, then if he says in 2 Timothy in the last days it's going to be this way well what's the difference then between the last days and the first days there's no dif there's no difference so if Paul just says well you know in the last days it's going to be like it was in the first days that's not much of a that's not much of an indication of the last days but if on the other hand what he's saying is in the last days God's people are this way um, and, and he's writing to Timothy about the body of Christ and about the last days and about what's going to lead up to the last days and, and those last days coming then it, it seems to me to make sense that what Paul's saying is you know in Romans 1 this is what mankind turned to in the last days God's people are going to turn to those same things and God's people will find themselves like like uh, and and um, you look at um, verse 5 having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away so they are you know in, in, in some sense they have some form of godliness they're trying to you know have an outward form of godliness at least but they deny the power thereof uh, if you look back in first Timothy um, kind of a a uh, companion passage to that first Timothy chapter 4 he says this now the spirit speaketh expressly then the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils so that first Timothy 4 passage usually we pair it with second Timothy 3 because they both talk about last days latter times and notice in in chapter 4 there of first Timothy he says some shall depart from the faith well, if you depart from the faith, what does that mean? You were in the faith. So, so that passage seems pretty clear. He's talking about people that were in the faith, uh, understood the truth, and then departed from that. So I, I would take that to be the same situation in 2 Timothy. So, so those two serve as, let's say, the bookends. You know, Romans 1 is, here's what man turned to when he turned away from God. 2 Timothy 3 is, Here's, he, here's what God's people end up doing in the last days. They become just like the world. They become just like that that God called them out of. And then there's those three, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 5, and 1 Timothy chapter 1 uh, in between. And, and as I was reading through those and studying them and thinking about them some, it occurred to me that, that each of those places where Paul and what we said when we first went through it is that each of those places where Paul talks about sin it's in a different context of course in Romans 1 it's the context of mankind turning away from God in time past in 2 Timothy 3 it's in the context of the church the body of Christ turning away from God uh, in the last days and, and each of those describes a specific context and a specific way in which sin makes itself known um, and those three and those other three, if you go to Romans chapter six, as we study Romans, and we've you know studied through Romans many times, and we talk about it a lot, it's it stands at the head of Paul's epistles. It's the first epistle from the apostle to the Gentiles, uh, written to the Gentiles. As you go through your Bible, it's the it's the first book in your Bible that specifically is written to the Gentiles, specifically written to. Uh, the people of the dispensation of grace, the age in which we live. So it, 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 it sets forth a lot of basic truth and basic understanding in that book. And when you get to Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, in Romans 1 through 5, he talks about salvation, justification by grace through faith. You know, he condemns man. He shows man the, the solution to his problem. And then we get to Romans 6, 7, and 8. Um, he talks about the position that we have in Christ as a result of the salvation that he describes in Romans 1 through 5. And Romans chapter 6, if you go down to verse, um, 
Oh, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we, sh- we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. So what's, what is it that we're freed from in Romans chapter 6? We're freed from sin. So, so each of these books, when he talks about the position we have, he's going to talk about how that frees us from something. And in Romans chapter 6, we are free from sin. If, if we are in Christ, if you go back to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so that's the, the premise here that he's building on. We are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Based on that fact, based on the fact that we are justified, we're at peace with God, we are one with Him, one with Christ, now what? Well, chapter 6, we are free from sin. Chapter 7, um, look down to verse, uh, verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now... We are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So in in Romans 7, what are we free from or dead to? The law. So we're free from the law. Romans chapter 6, we are dead to sin, free from sin. Romans chapter 7, we are dead to the law, free from the law. And, And in all of these, you know, as we go through these, you know, there, there's kind of a, a focus in each of these chapters, but there's also an overlap. You know, in other words, he, he talks about dying. The old man is crucified with him. The, the body of flesh is crucified with him. And then he's going to talk in Romans chapter 8. In fact, let's turn over there about being, well, we'll see, dead to the flesh. Verse um, uh, verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal man is enmity against God, for is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So ye are not, if any man is in the flesh, he cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh. So we are dead also to what? We're dead to the flesh. In Romans 6, we're dead to sin. Romans 7, we're dead to the law. Romans 8, we're dead from the flesh. When we are dead to those things, we are freed from them. We are free from sin. We are free from the law. And we're free from the flesh. Those, those uh, entities, if you will, don't need to have dominion over us anymore. They don't need to control us. And, and as I was reading the various passages where Paul talks about sin, it struck me that they, they match pretty closely that principle that he sets forth in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. That we are dead to sin, that we are dead to the law, and that we are dead to the flesh. And if you look at the other three places, um, 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians chapter 5, and 1 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul talks about sin, and, and in those three places, um, you know, in, 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 the, in the first instance, in Romans 1, he's talking about this is, this is what man turned to when he turned from God. In 2 Timothy, he's talking about this is what the body of Christ ends up. You turn to this again in the last days. In those places in between, in the, in, the pa- in the passage we're going to look at tonight, he is saying, he, he is telling us, here's why you as members of the body of Christ should turn away from sin. Here's why you shouldn't end up where 2 Timothy 3 is. You shouldn't end up, uh, what I'm going to describe in 2 Timothy 3 and 1 Timothy chapter 4, departing from the faith. If you stay in the faith and you, you turn away from sin, then here's how you're going to do that. And when he de- gives that description, he does it, I think, by going back to this principle in Romans that you're dead to sin, that you're dead to law, and that you're dead to the flesh. And each one of those places that he talks about sin and encourages us to turn away from sin, he does it by kind of referencing, don't forget, you're dead to sin. Don't forget, you're dead to the law. Don't forget, you're dead to the flesh. 
So let's look at each one of those and see um, how they fit. And you know, I'll talk about them. We can maybe see if you can guess which one I think they fit into. All right. So First Corinthians chapter six. It's kind of in the order that they come, so I guess you'll figure it out. First um, Corinthians chapter six. So First Corinthians chapter six. He um, is one of the places where he gives this list of sins. But, of course, he does it in the context of that we should turn away from these sins. Um, look at verse um, 9 of 1 first, first Corinthians 6. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you... But you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, just as in Romans 6, 7, and 8, you know, these, these principles sort of overlap in those chapters, so it will be here as we, as, you know, there's, I think there's one primary issue he's dealing with, but they overlap. So if you look at verse uh, 12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So clearly, there's, there's some issues there about the law. If you go on down um, in verse, uh, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. So there's some issues there about your flesh and, and how you use your flesh. But I think the 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 overriding principle here that Paul is pointing to in 1 Corinthians 6 is that you are dead to sin and you're free from sin and I think that because if you look in verse 11 such were some of you he gives those list of sins and he makes them he makes them uh, not just an issue of what you're doing but an issue an issue of your identification this is what you are. You are a, a thief. You are covetous. You are an idolater. You are an adulterer. Um, you are an abuser of yourselves of mankind. So he makes it an issue not just of what you do but who you are. But then he says you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. What does it mean to be sanctified? Set apart. So you're set apart for God's use. What's the word that we get from sanctified that Paul uses constantly? Saint. So everywhere that Paul says to the saints at Rome, to the saints at Corinth, to the saints, he's saying a saint is someone that's sanctified, that's set apart. So, so he points to our setting apart, and ye are justified. So what does it mean to be justified? To be declared righteous, that's right. Not to... To, not to be righteous in and of yourself, but to have righteousness imputed to you, to have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you and, and based on his righteousness for you to be declared righteous. So, so those, two, those two words are key in our salvation, in our basic salvation, in understanding we're, we're sanctified, we're justified. And he uses the term there that I think is interesting, which is, washed. Um, Paul, Paul only uses the term washed or washing uh, four times in all his epistles. One of those times, or washed, is another, one of those times in 1 Timothy, it's about uh, the widow if she washed the saint's feet. So that's not really about a spiritual thing, that's just about washing somebody's feet. It's a, it's a sign of submission and a sign of service. Uh, but it's also cleaning somebody's feet. So that, that we're not going to look at that one. But the three places, this is one, and go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And, and each place he uses that term, washed or washing, it, it's, about, it's about being cleansed, obviously. It's about that sanctification it's about having sin erased. It's about, you know, we talk about sin being washed away. And, and, and in that context, um, if you look at um, verse 25 of Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it 
by the what? Washing of water by the word. So, so the, what washes us is the word. So it's a, it's a cleansing like you would get when you, when you wash yourself with water, but it's washing with the word. But notice the word that's used there with it, that he might sanctify. What was the word back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? But you're washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified. That sanctification and the cleansing, so sanctify and cleanse it, has to do with the washing away of sin. With the with you are no longer a sinner, you're now a saint. You're no longer unclean, you're now clean. So that term there, washing, when Paul uses it in Ephesians 5, it has tied with it, again, sanctification. Titus, Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Paul uses the term here again in Titus um, chapter 3 um, and verse number, uh, well, you start, you, he's uh, uh, like kind of a short list of sins here even, verse 3 of Titus 3, for we, are, for we ourselves also were sometime foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lusts, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So it's the washing of regeneration. It's when he regenerates our spirit, makes us alive in Christ. And notice the word that goes with it, verse 6, which he shed on us abundantly, that is the, 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 the washing and the renewing, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That being justified. When you're washed, you are what? justified. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the washing, but we are washed, but we are sanctified, but we are justified. And as the other two places Paul uses that terminology about washing, in Ephesians chapter 5, that washing brings sanctification. In Titus chapter 3, that washing brings justification. So I think that that 1 Corinthians chapter 6 passage where he's talking about you know that that we 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 should the, this is not what you are anymore you shouldn't be doing these things I think he's pointing back to the fact that you are dead to sin because you are washed you are sanctified you are justified and that washing washed away sin that that justification made you no longer I'm sorry that sanctification made you no longer a sinner but a saint and that justification declared you no longer to be a sinner but to be now righteous in his sight so so that passage where he talks about sin he's he's saying you are dead to sin these things were a part of sin and when you were in sin and they they don't belong now that you're dead to sin all right, go to go to um, First Timothy. We'll just do these in the order that, that Paul goes through them. There, First Timothy chapter one. So we are dead to sin, washed, sanctified, justified, cleansed from our sin. Dead to sin. First Corinthians chapter six. First Timothy chapter one, uh, verse mm, verse five. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. So they desire to be teachers of the law, but they don't understand what they say, they don't understand what they affirm, they don't understand what the law is all about. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, Knowing this, that the law is not for a righteous, made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, 
for the godly, uh, the ungodly, and for sinners, for holy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. So Paul tells us there. So here's the law. The law is is good if a man use it lawfully. Keep your hand right there and go back to Romans 7 where Paul talks about the law and, and being dead to the law. Uh, and he says um, in verse um, 6, we, we read verse 5 uh, and we read part of verse 6. So Romans chapter 7 verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. So is the law a bad thing? The, the law is dead and gone. Did God kill it because it was a bad thing? No, no, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. So, so Paul says, the law is good and just and holy. The, uh, uh, look down in verse um, 12. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. That law is holy and just and good. The, the problem was with me. The problem is with mankind. The problem is with Israel. Couldn't keep that law. So when Paul says over in 1 Timothy verse, uh, uh, chapter 1 verse uh, 8, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. So the law is not a bad thing. The law is a good thing as long as you use it lawfully. And what's the lawful use? Verse 9, the law is not made for a righteous man but for the lawless and disobedient. So, so the law is not made for righteous men. It's not made to make men righteous. It's made to show man their sin. So, so in 1 Timothy, he, he say, so the law was not made for a righteous man. If you are, how, how did, Keith, how did you define justified? Declared righteous. So if you are declared righteous, is the law for you? No, it's not, because the law is not made for a righteous man. So in this passage, I think Paul's picking up on his theme from Romans chapter 7 and saying, you're dead to the law, because the law, the law is good if you use it lawfully, but the lawful use of the law is not to make it to not to try to put it on and apply it to a righteous man. It's for the lawless and disobedient, ungodly and sinners, unholy and profane, murders of fathers, murders of mothers, manslayers, whoremongers, them that defile themselves with mankind, men stealers, liars, perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sin. And notice how, it, this is just a side note, but these lists of sins, one of the things that Paul almost always gets in there, just if you think, well, I'm not a, a murderer of fathers, and I'm not a murderer of mothers, and I never slew anyone, and I'm not a whoremonger, and I don't defile myself with mankind, and I don't steal men. But I might have told a lie once, somewhere along the line. He always kind of slips that liar thing in there, just in case you're reading through the list and saying, but not me, not me, not me, not me. And he always gets that last one and says, well, not this is the last one, but he always throws that little word in there, liar, and then we'll have to say, well, yeah, I probably at some point along the line told a lie. And that's why, you know, as we studied through this the first time, it's, it's so silly to try to say, well, this sin is worse than this sin, this sin is worse. When Paul gives these lists of sins, you know, he puts that little sin in there. In fact, if you keep your hand right here, just a, you know, a little, hmm? That's true. I shouldn't have called it a little sin. It's a little word. Four letters. It's a four-letter word. Liar. So, um, yeah, it's a four-letter word. If you go over to Revelation um, chapter 22, um, and, uh, I'm sorry, 21, verse 8. Chapter 21, verse 8. 
uh, this is this is the one that that, that really kind of settles the issue here. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So so there with all you know, well I'm not abominable and I'm not a murderer and I'm not a whoremonger and I'm not a sorcerer and I'm not an idolater, but I probably told a lie somewhere along the line. Not probably. I've told a lie somewhere along the line. It, it gets you. So that, 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 that word that Paul puts in, that little four-letter word, that's a very big thing, um, liar, is, is important. And he, and he adds it in these lists you know, for that purpose because I think it kind of levels the playing field. Uh, but back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul's, Paul's point here is that as a righteous man in Christ, then you are not under the law. The law has no hold on you. The law has no dominion over you. You are free from the law, that being dead in which you were held. Because the law can only have a, a hold on you if you are a sinner, and it's pointing out your sin. And if you're righteous, then and you're free from sin. So therefore you're righteous, so therefore the law has no hold on you. And finally, if you go over to Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, and of course this is, I don't, I don't think we looked through this list, although, but it's one that, that Keith had pointed out to me, hey, there's another list there that we didn't really talk about, Galatians chapter 5, and of course Galatians, you could, you could make the assumption, and, and I think it wouldn't be invalid to say, well, this is about the law, because you know, in, in the first part of chapter 5, um, he says in verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every, um, every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, who serve you are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. So, you know, there, there, is, there is an issue there with the law, the whole book of Galatians is written because people were Jews were coming in trying to put the Gentiles back under the law, and Paul is writing the book of Galatians to say you don't need to go back under the law. But in that, if you go back to Galatians chapter three, as he's making this point about not going back under the law, he says this in chapter three, verse one: "O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you?" that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the, what? Flesh. So the issue at Galatia, in the churches of Galatia, is if you've begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And of course, the answer to that rhetorical question is no. Not only are you not made perfect by the flesh, but you are dead to the flesh. And if you go over to chapter 5, further down in chapter 5, and verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Well, verse 18, if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. So there's that, that law. Um, but if you go back up a verse before that, what's the lead up to that? It's about the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you're led, so, so the, the problem here is the flesh. Verse 18, but if you're led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, stripes, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Verse 24, and this is one of our key verses for how to deal with sin. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. 
So they that are Christ, verse 24, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So if the flesh is crucified, then we are what to the flesh? We are dead to the flesh, free from the flesh, because the flesh is crucified. So that passage, Galatians chapter 5, is Paul expounding upon and explaining how does being dead to the flesh allow you, help you, to avoid this list of sins? Well, it does that by realizing you're dead to the flesh. How does being dead to the law allow you to avoid that? Well, being dead to the law means you are righteous in God's sight and you don't need to, to have this constant list that you're keeping track of. How does being dead to sin? Well, being dead to sin tells me that I am washed, sanctified, justified, complete in Christ, righteous in Him. So, so those, those places where Paul talks about sin, deals with sin, the three places where he's saying to the body of Christ, don't, <laughs> don't be doing this. D don't, don't be doing, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, don't get yourself involved in this. Galatians, don't, that's not what the Spirit would lead you to do. And then 1 Timothy, don't put yourself back under the law and, 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 and picking out these sins of the flesh by the law. Each one of those places, he's, he's, I think, referring back to Romans. You are dead to sin, you are dead to the law, and you are dead to the flesh. And, and here's how you put that into practice in your life. And the reason he, you know, all of those things... Uh, letting the law come back in your life, letting sin come back in your life, letting the flesh come back in your life, are going to lead you down the road where 2 Timothy 3 is, where the body of Christ ends up. So in each case, he, he uses one of those principles to say, you're dead to the sin, dead to the law, dead to the flesh. Don't go back there. Live in who you are in Christ. Live in the fact that you are sanctified and justified, righteous in His sight, live in the fact that you uh, are free from the law and the law has no hold on you and the law does not condemn you and neither should you condemn yourself and live in the fact that, that your flesh is crucified with Christ and your flesh has no hold on you anymore because it's crucified with Christ and your life is now in Him. So each of those, and, and as I said, as I, as I read through those passages where he talks about the sins, it just, you know, it, it seemed to me and I'll admit my mind works in mysterious ways. It seemed to me that in each of those places, he's, he's pointing back, hey, you're dead to sin, you're dead to the law, you're dead to the flesh. So, does anybody have a question, comment about tonight? Being dead to all those things. So, all right. Clear as mud. Pretty simple. Well, it's one of those things that's easy to say, but hard to do sometimes. So, that's... That's the way it is. So, yeah, it's that, for me, the one, that, that verse 24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. You say, well, well, yeah, that's simple. <laughs> okay, but just, yeah, just try to do it every day. And it makes it more difficult. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because unjustified anger is one thing that, you know, and I can do that pretty good. So, um Anyhow, let's, yes, I'm sorry, Tammy, go ahead. So, um, I don't always know what all these words mean. Okay. Um, I, you know, lie doesn't seem to be in that list. I, I, I acknowledge that. It doesn't seem to be in that list. Um, you know, revelings, but that's really not lying. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, can, you can try to fit it in under uncleanness or seditions, heresies. But no, it doesn't have lie in there. Specifically, doesn't list lie. That's that's, why that's right. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's why. That's why. Yeah, because it doesn't have lie listed there. So then Keith wanted me to use it, so I had to figure out what it meant. So um, variance. Yeah, variance. Yeah. If you vary from the truth, I guess that would be a lie. So there you go. There you go. I rest my case. Verla, Verla, Verla made my case, so there you go, there you go. Attorney Verla, yeah, she, she made the case for us, so, yeah. Yeah, there, there you go, variance and emulations. Emulation is, would be, yeah, if you're emulating something that you're not, yeah, yeah, that's true, sounds good. Liar, liar, right there, right there, so.
Um, anything else? All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our God and Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that, that Paul does in his epistles. He's the, the apostle of grace, but he warns us also um, how easy it is to slip back into the, into the works, uh, trying to justify ourselves by the works of the law and allow the flesh uh, and sin to rule in our lives. And we just pray that through, through taking in your word that we would move away from that and have your truth live out through us and not uh, the lie of Satan. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.